The region for which we call Europe contains an enormous amount of cultural, historical, and natural beauty. But one facet of these lands that people often overlook is its rich prehistory. Throughout the past million years, Europe has played a significant role in the story of hominin evolution. Today we will be talking about the prehistory of Europe with a focus on the arrival of our species and their effect on the modern inhabitants of Europe. The oldest hominin remains from Europe come from Georgia and date back to 1.8 million years ago. Whether you consider Georgia to be in Europe or not, what is important about this example is the high latitude for which the hominins lived. The Dimanisi hominins were an archaic and divergent population who belonged to the species Homo erectus. Their technology was fairly simple and lacked the ability to produce fire and likely lacked the ability to produce clothing. Their push north indicates that hominins were becoming increasingly successful in a more diverse array of climates. The next relatively well-known population to appear in Europe was Homo antecessor. These fossils are from Spain and date back between 1.2 million and 800,000 years ago. They could have crossed the Strait of Gibraltar or possibly spread all the way from the Middle East. No one knows for certain. Originally, they were thought to have been the ancestors of the future hominins in the region, but now are generally regarded as an evolutionary offshoot. They would eventually go extinct and be replaced by the descendants of Erectus. Homo heidelbergensis were the first hominins to really spread out through Europe. They are known to inhabit all over the Mediterranean, much of mainland Europe and as far north as the British Isles. They are very significant because they brought a new wave of culture and technology that would eventually evolve into the famous Neanderthals. The oldest remains that could represent early Neanderthals are known from as far back as 400,000 years ago. Their morphology would eventually spread to all regions of Europe. Neanderthals were a very significant species in regards to human evolution because they have taught us an incredible amount about how middle and late Pleistocene hominins lived. They are also significant because they contribute to the DNA of just about all modern humans. It was once thought that only Eurasian populations had their genetics, but new findings have shown that nearly all populations have some degree of Neanderthal DNA. The spread of modern humans into Neanderthal lands was a very interesting time in our species' evolution. These first Europeans were once known as the Cro-Magnons, but this name has not been predominantly used in scientific literature since the 1990s. Instead, the name EEMH, which stands for Early European Modern Humans, is most often used. This may sound trivial to you, but it makes much more sense than the name Cro-Magnon, which comes from a single rock shelter in France. These people have been the center of much debate about European racial and genetic origins and what their part was in the extinction of the Neanderthals. The rest of the video will be focused on these populations and their legacy. Our species originated in the continent of Africa between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago. This is strongly supported by both fossil and genetic evidence. Some early migrations left Africa over 100,000 years ago, but were more or less limited to the Levant and the Arabian Peninsula. The most significant waves out of Africa occurred between 70,000 and 50,000 years ago. This wave dispersed along the southern route across Asia and into Australia. Dispersal into Europe would not occur until after 50,000 years ago. The earliest indication that sapiens may have been venturing into Europe comes from the Balkan Bohunishian industry beginning 48,000 years ago. This industry seems to be derived from the Mirian industry of the Middle East, suggesting these tools represent the first presence of modern humans in Europe. The earliest actual bones of modern humans in Europe date between 45,000 and 43,000 years ago. These remains correspond with the spread of the Proto-Orignatian culture that spread across much of Europe. 
40,000 years ago, the Heinrich IV event caused a period of extreme seasonality in Europe. This event may have put a massive pressure on both the new sapien inhabitants as well as the native Neanderthals. The sapiens adapted to this challenge and the true Orignatian industry was created. It would quickly spread across much of Europe and replace the Neanderthal Mausterian technology. The replacement of the Neanderthals by modern humans is a topic of much debate with few clear answers. We may have outcompeted the Neanderthals when they had fallen on hard times or more or less assimilated with their populations. Genetics of living human populations in combination with fossil DNA extracted from both Neanderthals and modern humans favors the idea that the Neanderthals were mostly replaced. However, advocates of the assimilation model argue that Neanderthal DNA was much more prevalent in early modern humans, indicating that assimilation was somewhat common. One factor to keep in mind is how low population density was throughout Europe during this time. Various population estimates have yielded population sizes less than 5,000 individuals, while others have averaged to less than 10,000. This is of course a very small population for all of Europe. Their populations were only one-tenth as dense as contemporary sapien populations. The Neanderthal population had been steadily declining before sapiens even set foot in the region. Their migration into Europe may have been more or less unopposed, though this topic is far from resolved. Early Orignatian skulls also feature traits that are somewhat reminiscent of the Neanderthals. They had a slightly flattened skull cap with a protruding occipital bun. Both of these traits, as well as others thought to be the result of Neanderthal integration, were eventually bred out of the gene pool. The 40,000-year-old OAC-1 from Romania was found to have between 6-9% to Neanderthal DNA. This indicates that it had a Neanderthal ancestor between 4-6 to six generations earlier. However, this DNA did not make a substantial contribution to the genomes of later Europeans. Evidence shows that Neanderthal genes in modern humans gradually decreased with time, which suggests that they were selected out of the gene pool. Neanderthal genes may have had less of an effect on modern human populations than some have suggested. It is also important to remember that the first humans to migrate into Europe had a unique morphology regardless of their integration with the Neanderthals. Their morphology had already diverged from Asian lineages. They were similar to present-day humans in general, however their bones were thicker and more robust. Compared to modern Europeans in particular, they had broader and shorter faces. Their brow ridges were more prominent, their teeth were bigger, and they had horizontally oriented cheekbones and more rectangular eye sockets. Some of these features are more common in present-day East Asian populations. They were fairly tall, with men averaging 176 centimeters or 5 feet 9 inches. Women averaged 163 centimeters or 5 foot 4 inches. Before genetic testing methods for ancient specimens, it was assumed that early European modern humans were of light skin. Light skin is often a beneficial adaptation to acquire more vitamin D from the sun in areas where the sun is less luminous. Of these three main genes responsible for light skin, only two of them experienced positive selection as late as 19 to 11,000 years ago. Furthermore, these genes would not become common throughout Europe until the Bronze Age around 5,000 years ago. The reason that light skin did not develop until relatively recently but eventually became so common could be for a number of reasons. The diet of early Europeans was rich with nutrients from big game animals, while agricultural European diets often lacked vitamin D. Diet is one factor, but others such as low population or cross-continental movement may have limited the spread of this trait. Overall, the first Europeans did not look all that similar to modern groups. This is partially due to their continued evolution throughout the Paleolithic, but more importantly, continued migrations. 
Much of the modern European genome actually comes from Neolithic farmers that migrated into Europe around 7,000 years ago. These people were tall, had lighter skin, and brought farming to the native tribes. Another large wave of people came from the eastern steppe regions of modern Russia and Ukraine around 5,000 years ago. These three ancestral populations are primarily responsible for modern European genetics. Therefore, the idea that modern Europeans are directly descended from its first sapient inhabitants is not necessarily true. They are partly descended from them, but the story is much more complex. It is important to study and understand these people because they left behind incredible works of art, extremely well-made tools, and certainly have had an effect on modern European genetics. Accordingly, the rest of the video will be discussing the cultures that inhabited Europe following the arrival of our species into the region. To understand Upper Paleolithic Europe, the period from 50,000 years onward, archaeologists and anthropologists use archaeological industries. An archaeological industry or techno-complex is a grouping of tools based on their characteristics, a specific way of making tools that we can identify in the archaeological record. Unlike the bones of ancient people, stones do not disintegrate. They stay around forever. This gives us a much better proxy to understand how stone tool creation evolved and how ancient cultures moved around. Upper Paleolithic Europe had multiple distinct archaeological industries. As mentioned earlier, the first presence of our species in Europe was likely the 48,000-year-old Bohunician industry from southeastern Europe. Soon after, the proto orognatian industry would develop and by 43,000 years ago spread over much of Europe. This industry had a focus on creating blades, but mainly bladelets. Blades and bladelets can be used to create projectiles such as composite spears or arrows and can also be used as knives. The Orognatian proper would not appear until 37,000 years ago when humans were already living over most of Europe and the Neanderthals were nearly or completely extinct. This culture was the first major sapient industry of Europe and consisted of bone or antler points with grooves in the bottom and fine blade and bladelet stone tools. More importantly, they are some of the first humans to create art. The sophistication of their art was truly unprecedented for the time. They made complex cave paintings, human and animal figurines, and even the earliest undisputed musical instruments. The Orignation was a long-lived industry that survived in multiple areas until around 26,000 years ago. The next major industry to appear was the Gravettian. It first appeared around 32,000 years ago in the Crimean mountains of southern Ukraine and soon spread all over Europe. It has been theorized to have come from the Near East and the Balkans. The Gravettian developed during a bitterly cold period and, as a result, much of their lifestyle was shaped by climate. The Western and Eastern Gravettian cultures developed quite differently. The Eastern Gravettians were specialized mammoth hunters, while in the West they hunted a larger variety of prey, but still mainly megafauna. Still, the culture was relatively homogenous for quite some time and was the last European culture to be considered unified. They made many innovations including large socketed points, tanked arrowheads, and even boomerangs. They lived in small village-like centers and had well-developed burial rites. Some were buried with many expensive goods such as the Prince of Irene Candide. His grave was elaborately decorated with many shell beads, mammoth ivory, and a very long flint blade. The Gravettians also made many forms of art including numerous cave paintings and Venus figurines. The Gravettian culture would eventually begin to diversify and transition into other cultures after the last glacial maximum. Three prominent post-Gravettian cultures were the Salutrian, Magdalenian, and Epigravettian. The Salutrians were a very advanced flintknapping culture from Western Europe, including modern-day France, Spain, and Portugal. They made the first truly magnificent points in archaeology. Some of them were very large and thin a form that is considerably hard to achieve. 
these nappers would have had dozens of tools and they would have spent decades napping. As a flint napper myself, it is very hard to convey to others how excellent these points truly are. They may have not been very practical as spear points as they are often very thin, though they may have been used as knives or for ceremonial reasons. Besides the larger points, they also made a large variety of well-crafted stone tools including arrowheads, blades, scrapers, and awls. Also present in Seleucian technology are bone needles, pendants, beads, cave paintings, and other forms of art. The Seleucian flourished in Western Europe between 22 and 17,000 years ago, but would eventually transition into the Magdalenian around 17,000 years ago. This culture would make much less impressive stone points, but rather put an emphasis on osseous spears and harpoons. Bone and antler were also used for a variety of other things, including various tools and art. Stone was still commonly used, but often as small microliths. The Magdalenian culture also made similarly impressive art, such as the cave painting at Lascaux. The Magdalenian culture would last until the end of the Upper Paleolithic. During the time of the Seleucian and later Magdalenian, the Epigravetian existed in Eastern Europe. As its name suggests, it was a continuation of the Gravetian culture. The culture was more or less the same as the earlier Gravetian, but also carried on unique traditions from the Italian peninsula, Southern Europe, and Eastern Europe. This culture would remain in these regions all the way up to the end of the Upper Paleolithic. The end of the last glacial maximum saw major changes to how and where people lived. For the first time, European modern humans could migrate north into northern Europe, including Scandinavia and parts of Britain. The extinction of much of the megafauna throughout Europe ended a lifestyle that had been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Megafaunal prey provided early people with an abundance of protein and organ meat. This high-quality diet provided relatively good health compared to even Neolithic diets. After much of the megafauna went extinct, many ancient people throughout Europe and the world had to change their diets. Some populations developed diverse diets that were arguably healthier than purely meat, while the eventual adoption of agriculture had detrimental effects to human health in the Neolithic. The end of the Upper Paleolithic and corresponding period of climate change and mass extinctions would fundamentally change how people lived and was a major turning point in the history of our species. Well, that will be it for the video. I hope you enjoyed learning some general information about European prehistory. This video was essentially an introduction to the European Upper Paleolithic. I plan to eventually cover the Orignatian and other cultures in much more detail. And sorry about my voice for this video, I kinda lost my voice so that's why I might sound a little bit different. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video and if you want to see more, throw me a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next episode of North O2. A presto.